So they find no difference uh, between uh, patients uh, with anxiety and controls in terms of discriminative paradigms. But let me show you what that means. Um, on the right, you see anxiety patients in terms of their response to both a CS plus, let's say this is a shock, right? So this is presence of a shock uh, is a CS plus and the CS minus is uh, the absence of the shock. And what you can see there is that the anxiety patients show an elevated response, uh, arousal response, I think this is a skin conductance response, to both a CS plus as well as a CS minus. Whereas healthy subjects show a significantly elevated response to a CS plus, but don't show an elevated response to CS minus. But the level of the response of the healthy subjects to the CS plus is not as great, obviously, as uh, the arousal level is not as great as the anxiety patients. So if you look at CS plus versus CS minus, they're basically the same. And so the question is, why is it that uh, uh, anxiety patients are unable to discriminate between the CS plus and the CS minus? It's been a great debate uh, in the learning literature, and particularly in the anxiety disorder, adult anxiety disorder literature. We decided to tackle that debate with our behaviorally inhibited children, we used a potentiated startle paradigm. And let me walk you through this. It's sort of a complicated paradigm, but if you, uh, instead of looking there, if you just watch me, uh, it'll actually be better. I'll act it out. So the subject comes in and we put a collar on them. And the collar has a nozzle in it. Um, and that nozzle is attached to a uh, rubber tube, which is attached to a switch, which is attached itself to a bottle of compressed air. Okay? Then the subject's seated in a chair, and they see a blue screen and a green screen. And there are different ways that you can do this, but in our way of doing it, what we did is we told them, when you see a blue screen, you may get a blast of this air on your larynx. And we show them what a blast of air would be. We blast them with this air, air on their larynx, OK? It's mildly uncomfortable. It's not terribly uncomfortable. It's mildly uncomfortable. We tell them when they see a green screen, you're not going to get blasted at all. You're, you're safe. Blue screen is uh, the blast of air. You may get a blast of air. Green, sc green screen is your safe. And what we measure from them, we also put um, two tiny electrodes underneath one of their eyes and earphones into their ears. And over the earphones, we play these very fast blasts of white noise, which startle them, OK? And the question is, and we measure their startle with the, these tiny electrodes under their eye, because when someone is startled, you get a little bit of a startle response, a blink response, uh, by the movement, the EMG movement of the orbicularis oculi muscle underneath the eye. Okay? So basically, the question is, what will uh, our behaviorally inhibited subjects startle more when they see the threat screen versus the safe screen, or will they startle the same? And here's what the data say. Data are pretty interesting. What they show is, the, uh, sorry for the color, but on the left are your low behaviorally inhibited kids. And what you can see there, this is the difference between safe the safe, which is the green screen, minus the ITI, and that there's basically uh, no uh, effect uh, of uh, whether you're anxious or healthy within our low behaviorally inhibited subjects. But within our high behaviorally inhibited subjects, those, remember we did this uh, psychiatric screen on them, those who had a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, that is any anxiety disorder, they showed a heightened startle to the safe uh, cue. So that is, remember, the issue for in conditioning is, why, is do uh, anxious subjects not discriminate between safety and threat? And the answer is, in amongst behaviorally inhibited subjects, yes, 
if you're behaviorally inhibited and if you are uh, anxious, then actually you don't discriminate between safety and threat. What's interesting here is that amongst our low behaviorally inhibited subjects who were anxious, we don't find that discrimination. So it's really the interaction of behavioral inhibition and that anxiety disorder which leads to the lack of discrimination uh, between safety and threat on this particular task. And I want you to remember that because that theme of the interaction between behavioral inhibition and anxiety disorder really comes up now in the next two sets of data that I'll be presenting to you. Okay, the third aspect of attention that we've been interested in is something called error monitoring. Uh, error monitoring or response monitoring is the ability to track one's actions. It, it is associated with uh, flexibility and efficiency of response adaptation. Um, and it is, uh, one of the interesting things about it is that there are a lot of studies, both functional neuroimaging studies and electrophysiological studies, which suggest that an area in the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex is associated with the control over this response monitoring ability. Um, Response monitoring, by the way, has a long history. So back in 1966, uh, when people were studying that, they uh, uh, identified a behavioral ways for looking at response monitoring. And that is what a subject does after they've made an error. So is there a presence or absence of self-correction? And is there a latency to implement that self-correction after making an error? So imagine that you're doing some sort of task and you've made an error. What is your reaction time going to be if you're good in response monitoring uh, after you've made an error? Well, it's probably going to be slower right, on the, on the trial subsequent to making error. The task that has been used for that in a number of different cognitive studies is something called a flanker task. And this just illustrates for you what that is. Um, uh, here's what the subject has to do. They have to press the right button if the arrows are going, if the center arrow is going to the right, and the left button if the, uh, sub if the arrow is going to the left. That little red dot is centers them and fix, has them fixate on the central arrow. But what you can see here is that there are two types of trials. There are compatible trials. That's with all the arrows going in the same direction. And there are incompatible trials. That's with some of the arrows going in different direction. The arrows, by the way, are called flankers, hence the name flanker task. Um, and what you can imagine is that for compatible trials, subjects would be much faster. And for incompatible trials, subjects would be much slower. And the question is, are there these differences in reaction time uh, on the flanker task? And the flanker effect is the difference in reaction time between compatible and incompatible trials. But the other thing to remember is that if you make a mistake on a trial, either compatible or incompatible, do you slow down your reaction time uh, on the subsequent trial after that? So we looked at that question in our behaviorally inhibited kids. Um, and what we found is, in fact, that our behaviorally inhibited uh, subjects, these are again now our adolescents, and they are identified, as I said, as behaviorally inhibited in terms of their stable behavioral inhibition over early childhood, um, that the behaviorally inhibited subjects are actually show greater response monitoring than low behaviorally inhibited kids, right? And that can be shown by their reaction time, uh, uh, the reaction time uh, of the high behaviorally inhibited kids as opposed to low behaviorally inhibited kids. So they are actually slower on a trial after making an error compared to um, uh, low, uh, non behaviorally inhibited children. Now, uh, one of the nice things about the, this flanker task, at least nice for us, is that um, you can actually look at it both behaviorally and electrophysiologically. And there is an ERP uh, that can be uh, derived from the subject after they pressed, after they pressed the button and made a mistake. 
and it's called the error-related negativity. 